Welcome back to the PLC Professor Workshop. This is one of two studios in my home. I have a 20 by 20 workshop, 400 square feet. And this studio, I guess you'd call it, is in the corner of my workshop. It's actually my favorite studio. The other one is upstairs. It's a little bit more luxurious. Uh, same basic equipment, but I just love being around the equipment. I like the stuff behind me. These are my little buddies, I guess. I know that sounds absurd. Anyway, uh, speaking of which, in this project, and this is part three of a discussion of a complete controls engineering project from beginning to end. Not all the details. That would be impossible. Just some general information to maybe uh, grease your skids so you can get your th through your first project a little quicker. And my heart is for the people that are struggling to gain the knowledge they need to do projects, not for those that are already successful and merely are looking for something to give them affirmation that they're smart. Uh, <laughs> I have no interest in that. Uh, but if you're willing to learn and you're focused on learning, then you're in the right spot because that's my goal to show as much equipment as I can to share my experience, knowledge transfer, to pass it on to another group of people. Now this project, we went through the lineup on some materials in part one. As I said, this is part three. And by the way, uh, this is an entertainment. If you're looking for entertainment, you know, stop this, go back to the search and YouTube and find something else. But if you aren't looking for information, specific information or guidance, this is a good spot. And you can always fast forward because 90% of the video is not going to be me talking in the camera. It's going to be on screen captures in software. So behind me is some of the equipment that we're using in this project. And some of it's coincidental and some of it's not. Now, over my shoulder here, I don't know if you can see how well you can see, but there's a conveyor right here. And this conveyor has a small three-phase 240 motor on it. And this particular variable frequency drive is one of the few that are 115 volt single phase in and 243 phase out. So I'm actually using a drive almost identical to this in the project. It's just a different horsepower rating. And it's 233 phase in and out, not 115 in single phase. But the programming and use is 100% identical. So I am using this drive more or less on a conveyor on the actual real project. Also on the project, and that's why this stuff is sitting here is because if I have the equipment, some of the equipment that I'm going to use, I get it out and I set it all up and I play with it. In other words, I actually test out some of my logic and that saves commissioning time on the shop floor at the build site. So the equipment that I'm actually using, that's an L27 ERM right there with the 16 in, 16 out, analog in out and high speed counter. We're not using these modules right here, okay? And we're not even really using the digital and analog field device simulators that are attached. So this is really a piece of equipment that I use for everything, but I might change out the processor or the controller for different projects. If I'm doing lab project manuals, which you can see some right here in the background, it doesn't matter what it is as long as it is a controller or processor and I.O. that is compatible with RS Logic Studio Logic Designer. Then I also have, and I'm not sure you can see it because I might be sitting in the way, is this CR30 safety relay. Uh, I think I'll change positions so you can see better, but before I do, here's two stepper motors. These are those AMCI combo controller driver motors. This is a 23 and this is a 34. Then we have a seven inch panel view. So if I rotate around here, so you can get a better picture of 
the CR30 programmable safety relay. Now I'm using these two big contactors here, not the little ice cube relays that I'm going to use in the actual project. But I could care less about these lower contacts that are load size. I only care about these contacts up here that are part of the safety circuit. And then you can see here I have an e-stop and I have some push buttons and lights. This is a standard little board that I use when I'm working with variable frequency drives. As a matter of fact, this is designed for use in the classroom with those variable frequency drives. So this terminal strip actually wires up to the terminal strip on that VFD. You can't see it, but behind this motor right here, this little three-phase motor, there's a uh, big chunk of terminal blocks that would be connected to these terminal blocks on this board. Now this motor right here, I have disconnected. You can see the three leads right here. They're loose. And I have this motor from this conveyor connected in so I can test out my logic. So I don't have everything here. I did have a SCARA robot over behind my monitors here in my workshop that I actually, and you shouldn't do this, I probably shouldn't even admit it that I did it, but I pulled the cover off of my panel here in the garage, my electrical panel, and I had some empty uh, spots on the uh, breaker box panel. And so I took and I wired up a female extension cord end to a two pole circuit breaker and then snapped it in there and then used that to plug into the SCARA robot to give me 208. And that's what I drove the robot with. And then I did all the interface that I'm going to describe later. And I sat here with the pendant and actually programmed that robot to do some things. But mainly I was interested in integrating it by ethernet into this L27 ERM back here. So that's the kind of stuff I sit around here and do. I'm really blessed. And my word for the day is the rules that I adapted years ago for the workplace. Three rules. And they liked them so much at Ralston Purina, I automated most of a breakfast cereal plant in Battle Creek, Michigan. And um, they were, don't take it personal, don't push back, and don't take yourself too serious. And I shared those with everyone. And the first one, don't take it personal, why take it personal? They don't know you. So don't be thin-skinned. Don't take it personal. Because when the air clears in a, in a tight situation and everybody's left with egg on their face, you're going to be standing there having not lost your cool because you didn't take it personal. Now you're in command. Now what you do with that, that's something else. Second one, don't push back. You can stand your ground without pushing back. Now it's hard to do because we have mouths and we have brains and we have emotions and we want to share them sometimes. And we would be further ahead not to share our opinions sometimes. Now I'm guilty of, you know, running my mouth when I probably shouldn't because I get angry. But I, one of my rules that I'm always trying to obey is don't push back. You don't have to give in, but just don't escalate the situation. And the third one is the most important. Never take yourself too serious. That's where you really get in trouble when you think, well, people don't understand what I'm doing. This is really important. Don't take yourself too serious and everything will go much smoother. So in part three here, we're going to jump back into the electrical design and uh, let's do that. When we quit on this yesterday, when we quit yesterday on this, we were discussing remote I.O. Now, when you pick a controller or a PLC, PAC, whatever you want to call it, uh, you're picking a processor and you're picking an I.O. But before you pick I.O., you have to know what I.O. you have. Well, this particular processor or controller comes with fixed I.O., but it is Ethernet and it supports Ethernet IP so all of our remote I.O. is Ethernet IP. And we started with this 1732E, E for Ethernet, armor block, that picks up 16 sensors off the machine. But we have more remote I.O. than this. 
and that is the SMC uh, assembly that has the, the valve manifold and the valves as well as inputs and outputs. So let's go to SMC inputs DXPD and we have two of these and we'll double click on the second one. You can see right now it's not being used yet. Uh, I, I had to pick the hardware before the electrical design was done. In other words, I had to select what I was going to use for I.O. interfaces before the design was completed simply to save some time at the tail end to get into the commissioning earlier. Plus, and keep this in mind, jot it down if you can't remember it, when you're all done you need at least 20% spare I.O. and 20 to 25% of spare panel space. Now I'm not going to end up with the spare panel space simply because they had already purchased the enclosure and the panel before I even saw this project. As a matter of fact, to put the robot controllers, which there's three of them, you know, the control box, inside the panel, they cut off the bottom portion of the back plate, the panel, to fit in that 19 inch rack mount. So I have even less space to use than what you would in a standard panel that size. So it's going to be tight. The panel layout, we will get it done though. We just won't have 25% spare space. But we do have roughly 20% spare I.O. And you can always add more I.O. in the design that we have here. So. This is the DXPD input module. Now this is one module and it has uh, four ports on each module and each port can handle two sensors. Now you saw the same configuration with the 1732E and what this allows is less cabling. Uh, you still end up with cables going to this location, but then you have a splitter or a T to plug the cables into. Or again, these could be filled wireable. So I can take a filled wireable connector that has four pins, M12, that will screw into this device, and then it has four screw terminals inside the shroud because I showed you in the in part two how you can connect up two sensors power in common into four terminals on one of these field wireable connectors. So these are DXPDs. Uh, other than that there's nothing unique about them. I'm only showing the terminals for the sensors because remember these DXPDs, they are part of an assembly that you order from SMC. You don't assemble anything. You, you specify all the parts in it. And maybe we'll revisit this later if we have time and I'll show you the whole process of specking out one of these assemblies that has solenoid valves, has inputs and outputs, but it's still all you have to supply is 24 volts DC and an ethernet connection and you're connected and it will run. So we have SMC inputs DXPD 1 and 2. So we have two of these DXPDs. We also have an output. Now the output is a different part number and I did not uh, put the part number in the title you know for the sheet. But you can see up here that it says EX600 DYPB. That's an output uh, assembly module section in this main SMC assembly that we ordered. And I have three outputs connected to it. Now these particular outputs, they are solenoid valves that could have been connected over here except for we didn't know what the voltage levels were and not all output modules give you multiple groups of outputs that you can use different voltages for. So there are some output modules that have 
more than one hot in common and so you can have different voltages going through the same output module and we're not doing that okay now these little modules here if you want to call them that these are actually built into the valve manifold so these are not modules these are the actual electronic interfaces between ethernet and the actual solenoid valves so these valves right here for instance these two right here would be one valve body it's a double solenoid valve and it's mounted right to the manifold another double solenoid valve double solenoid double solenoid these over here are single solenoid and we could have expanded our use of the direct interface to valve valves on the manifold the problem is this had already been ordered and was being assembled before these changes came up now these valves control releases on access to the the fence in other words the where the raw materials go in for the robots to depalletize these release the opening so you can open a door open a drawer and put in raw product or components in a form of a little pallets that the robots then depalletize as they're assembling whatever the part is on the rotating fixture the rot rotary index so the difference here is these are standard DC outputs. You can hook anything to these. These are not. These are uh, valve bodies mounted on the valve manifold. Okay, so that's also remote I.O. And maybe I should relabel these three as remote I.O. SMC and shorten up the title a little bit. So these three sheets right here are part of the remote I.O. So let's, let's jump out of that. We've done enough with the I.O., the processor, the power, and the control circuit. Let's go to the robot interface. The first one I want to look at is the end of arm tooling. And these three are identical. Okay, so we'll zoom in here. And I don't really have anything labeled as far as function goes. But on the end of arm tooling, there are two cylinders. And each cylinder has multiple sensors. And I see now that I am actually missing one sensor, or I should say one device. These end of arm tooling, like on R1, has two separate end of arm toolings that you can rotate J4 on this robot to select one end of arm tooling or the other. So one of them is a suction cup to pick up something flat and smooth and put it in the nest. The other one picks up something that's not flat and smooth, a tube or a cylinder, and puts it in the nest. So the first end of arm tooling is just a suction cup, so to speak. So there's no sensors associated with that. There could be. You could have a vacuum sensor and with a vacuum sensor, when you grab the part, the vacuum pressure increases, or if you want to say the atmosphere decreases, to show that you actually have the part. In other words, you're not just sucking air from around the end of arm tooling. You've actually pulled a part in there. So we could have added that sensor. We didn't. Then the other end of arm tooling is a gripper. And that gripper has three sensors so actually now that i look at it i do have sufficient io represented here because i'm allowing for them adding the vacuum sensor even though we don't have one the other end of arm tooling the gripper has three open closed and gripping because when you close the gripper if there's no part there it's going to go all the way closed to a sensor if there is a part there and it's gripping it, then that means the motion of the grippers is somewhere between open and close. It's gripping. 
So we have part present for the vacuum, and then we have three sensors for that second end of arm tooling, open, gripping, and closed. And these connections right here, uh, obviously you gotta have uh, 20, you gotta supply 24 volts. And we're not supplying that. This 24 volts DC is internal to each individual robot. We have nothing to do with it. All that we're doing is we have to wire these sensors into a special connector on the top of the head of the robot. And then those, the wires or conductors from that connector go to the robot controller that's back in the main panel. And the robot program is what sees the state of those sensors to control the robot program. So we have three of these, one for each of three robots. They're all the same. I mean, the part numbers might be a little bit different, but they're basically doing the same thing. I think I will have to add another sensor to this diagram. Now remember, um, we're supplying the sensors because we're building the end of arm tooling, but we're not supplying the IO interface. That's part of the robot interface, but we're going to wire it up to the connector. Uh, robot number two has two grippers and they each have three sensors. Well, it's, it's four sensors, but one of the sensors has two, pos two positions in it. So in other words, um, one sensor can sense both closed and gripping and the other sensor senses open. Anyway, long story short, this is the IO interface built into the head of the robot. All we're doing is supplying the design. So you had to ferret this information out of the robot manuals, come up with the sensors on the cylinders or the valves, and then show a wiring diagram so the electrician or panel builder can do that wiring between the end of arm tooling and the electrical interface on the robot. But keep in mind, none of this IO comes back to our main controller. It's all within the robot. Okay, so that's the end of arm tooling interface. And again, you have to go to the robot manual, the manufacturer's manual, and sort out all this nomenclature before you design your system. Okay, now we got the robot controller interfaces. Now this is where it got a little bit more sticky because I, if I remember correctly, there are 68 pins or connectors or terminations. Remember that breakout board I showed you back in part one? And I don't know why FANUC is so stingy with the images of that breakout board, but we had a hard time finding anything on that breakout board. But some of the chats said that it's made by Wago, which means you could probably go to Wago and just keep looking at their catalog until you spotted it. But I think the robot manufacturer wants you to buy it from them, not Wago. Maybe that's why they hide the information. Nonetheless, what I did was I rearranged the, the order of the screw terminals or the terminal blocks, terminal connections to suit my diagram. Okay. So JRM 18 is the name of the connector on the back of that controller. And I showed you that in part one, it was a long 69 connection uh, connector that was mounted horizontally. And it comes with a dummy plug with, in particular, all these safety things are jumpered inside the dummy plug. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to run it without doing a bunch of wiring. You just plug in the dummy plug that comes with it and it jumpers these connections and these connections together. So what we have here is we have, and I'm going to jump back out here in a minute, but notice this is JRM 18, 1, 2, 6, 7, 14, 15, 24, 30. You see, they're not in order. Three, there's pin one, pin two, and pin three here in another dash box. So I, ten, I, I separated all of the connections into logical groups. 
So they're not in the order that they were or are actually on the connector. So you can see that if, if I had left them, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then this would all have to be spread out. There would have to be three, four, five. There'd have to be three screw terminals in between here and here. And then if something connected to three, four, and five, you would have those wires tangling with these wires in the diagram. I didn't want that. So it's up to you how you, uh, if you want to say CAD, your electrical interfaces. But here I put the e-stop and the fence interfaces in one spot. Now this is K2. And if I go down here a little bit, you can see K1 down here. So as it is, for my two channels for e-stop, you know, coming from the main controller to the robot. K1 is down here on pin 40, uh, EES2, and channel 2 is up here on EES1. It doesn't matter which you put where. I mean, these are just dry contacts. So this could be K1 and K2, and maybe logically, organizationally, it should have been just to make it easier to look, look at one comes before two, but don't worry about that kind of stuff. Now this is our fence control. And this comes from a relay that is operated by our safety relay that is programmed. So, uh, if you want to open the fence so you can go into the space, but you want the robot disabled, but you don't want to put it in e-stop. That's what EAS one and two are for. But notice that they're together right here. And I, I could have rearranged them and I could have put double EAS2 up here and EAS1 down here with EAS2. However, notice that we have 24 volts external in and 24 volts dash two. These two terminals, and you have to sort this out when you're doing your electrical design. So you go into the robot manuals and you start looking at the electrical interface and you'll find little notes like if you're going to use an external 24 volt supply, then you want to use this one. If you're going to use the internal one, then use this one. So I have these jumper together and then going to these two safety relay contacts. If I were to try to combine these differently, in other words, put the EAS two and ones together, then I would have run into another one of these situations where you're drawing wires that cross each other and kind of convolute the image. So everything associated with one channel and 24 volts is up here. Everything is associated with the other channel and zero volts is down here. So it had more to do with the zero volts and the 24 volts then EES1, EAS1, and so forth. Now, I probably would have put K1B here and K2B down here if I had been thinking a little further. Will it make any difference in the operation? Absolutely zero. You would probably never even noticed if I hadn't said anything. This is all information that you have to ferret out of the manuals, and it takes hours to do it. But this is the kind of things that you have to know and understand. Now, the robots can have a pendant connected up to them. And on the pendant, when you plug it into the back of the, the controller, and each robot has its own controller, so you can only plug, if you only have one pendant, you can only attach it to one robot at a time. When you attach it, you now have made that robot subject to the e-stop that's on the pendant. When the pendant's not plugged in, then you have the cap on that connector and the e-stop on the pendant is out of play. But remember, there's only one e-stop on the pendant and if you want to e-stop while you're training the robot or something and you want the, the main PLC to know it, the L27ERM, this is where you interface it, ESPB1, ESPB2. So these are the two channels for safety. And you see we have the 11 and 21 jumper together. 
So these two are in series going to our safety relay. Now we may change this once we have the opportunity to test this interface. I may end up taking and removing this jumper and then making this a common. In other words, I might leave them jumper together, I guess you could say, but run one conductor out here to give a common for channel one and channel two. There wasn't enough notes in the manual for me to make sure how this was going to work out. But I have accommodations for it. As a matter of fact, I could draw in a dashed line here with the reference back to my CR30 safety relay and then put a note here. May be necessary to interface correctly to the CR30. This is the kind of stuff you got to keep in mind when you're doing electrical design. Now I'll zoom back out here and you can see that out of my 68 connections, most of them are unused. None of these over here are used. These are digital I.O. over here where you can actually wire up digital I.O. to your robot and the robot program can access digital ins and digital outs to see things and do things totally as a standalone, uh, standalone controller. You can even add a PLC that is made by this robot company and each robot can have its own PLC. And remember that the robot can have multiple programs with many IO points. So these are very versatile robots. However, we're not using them in that way and we are using ethernet to communicate with this robot. So you'll notice that the only discrete signals between the robot and the main panel are, and actually this, this controller right here and all these screw terminals, it's in the main panel with a breakout board. So going from the breakout board to the L27 ERM or to the CR30 programmable safety relay are these wires right here. Now we do have the common connected here in case we want to wire up something here. And I haven't even looked to see what these are. In other words, I went through and I figured out what groups made the most sense. Like this is all the IO, but the numbers don't go in order. We'll zoom in here and look at this. Look, uh, JRM 184842. So look at the screw terminal space between digital input 101 and 102 and 103. You see what a crazy wiring mess that would make if you left all of these screw terminals for this whole thing in order, JRM 18, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so forth, you would have a rat's nest of lines on your drawing. So I've broken them all up into logical groups. And I will open up R2 so you can see it's identical. And R3 is identical. Uh, there's the HMI. And I have really nothing there right now. Uh, there, there is an e-stop and a reset button that will be on the enclosure with the panel view. So right down here on the enclosure, pendant enclosure for the panel view will be an e-stop and right above it a reset button. It's actually a dual purpose button. You can hit it, it's just a blue lit push button. You can press it to tell the system you want access inside the fence to the robot motion area. You push that button and the logic tells the robots to stop moving, not to stop in their tracks, but to finish their move. And then it inhibits the main controller from telling the robot to execute another motion. Okay. So it disables the robots. You go in and do whatever you want to do close the door, and then you hit that same button to reset it and let it continue. Now, I may make it two steps. You hit the button to reset the system, meaning to say that you're clear. Then you have to go to the HMI and press something to say to continue. Not sure yet how you want to do that. Those are the kind of options that you consider. Okay, VFD. Now, I don't have a lot on the VFD right now. I've got the safety. This is the torque safe off right here. And they are terminals that are labeled safe and safe T or safe torque off safety. 
and you supply 24 volts from the drive and then you go to a couple relay contacts that are part of the safety circuit. So if you hit an e-stop, these open and you remove 24 volts from these two screw terminals and the drive stops. You're not removing power from the drive. You still got three phase power. And so everything's powered up. It's just the whatever motor it's controlling is gonna come to a screech and halt right now. And that's what you want. This conductor going from 24 volts DC to this pin, you, these drives usually come with a jumper, a yellow wire that jumpers between these two terminals. So this, this uh, drive that I pointed to behind me, uh, it came with a wire jumpered between those two terminals from the factory. And then there's a set of jumpers between those three safety contacts. In other words, they're jumper together. That way you can power up this drive, hook a motor to it and run it because there's, there's no external e-stop. And what you're saying is in the default configuration that you're, you want to control it from the front control plate on the drive. If you remember what the drive looks like, you got a digital display and then you've got a keypad, you've got a green start button, run button, and a red stop button. So in the configuration, and you can do this configuration right in CCW, Connected Components Workbench with USB, or you can do it in 5000 through the ethernet connection. You can set it up so it is controlled solely by the faceplate or the control plate that's right on the drive. And what I'm going to show you later on is how to go and set it up so it's controlled over Ethernet. It's not real complicated, a bunch of parameters involved. And the first time you do it, it seems awkward. You can do it all with that five button touchpad. You know, it's like in a circle with up, down, left and right, and then a center button. You can do it with that, but you're going to get a sore finger after about 15, 20 minutes of thumping on that uh, membrane keypad and you don't want to use any kind of sharp object because it will wreck that keypad. So for right now that's enough for the drive. Uh, I'll go to cables and this is a spreadsheet. It, you can see there's two components to it because that's how I screen captured it out of Excel. So I did my cabling organization in Microsoft Excel. You can do it in any spreadsheet. And I use some colors to indicate certain things. And if I zoom in here, well, I have to zoom in closer. I can see that. You can't see the full width of it if I zoom in, but we'll move it around. Input. We'll start in the upper left corner. R-I-N decimal point zero. That is, remember, this is Excel. This is not RS Logic Studio Logic Designer 5000. This is Excel. So I had to hand type in all this information. RIN.0 is, or a tag that I created, it's probably a double integer, a dent, called RIN. And then it's, if it's a double integer, then it's point zero through point thirty one. And I have buffered my I.O., which I talked about a little bit in part one. So the actual module tag in that controller, that state is moved over to this tag, RIN.0, at the beginning of every complete program scan. So that's hand typed in, which means if you change that, then this spreadsheet is no longer accurate. So you got to be careful what you're doing. So think through your tag names and your nomenclature hard and long before you begin. The more time you spend organizing and engineering, the less time you fool around the field. There used to be a saying back when I got started, for every one hour of time you spend pre-thinking, organizing your project, you'll save seven hours in the field. Now think about that. So if you spend a whole day thinking about how you want to call your tag names, 
creating some charts like this that aren't filled in yet. But you know you've got an input that's the tube, ta tube tray presence proximity switch, but you don't even know the part number yet. You don't know the connector. You don't know the length. You don't know the extension splitter. You don't know any of that. But you can still start this list, and halfway through you may think, oh, you know, I don't like that tag name, and go back and change it. The shorter the better without losing the descriptive nature of it. So RIN.0 is a buffered input from a module input tag for input zero on that L27 ERM. The description is that it is the state of the tube tray presence. That's a part tray. And we're doing it with a Balif Prox. The connector is a M12 male four pin A coded. Now that's all important information when it comes to connectors. At first I was quite annoyed that I had to fool around with all of these connectors and try to sort them out because they are a pain in the butt. So if you're not familiar with these connectors and you're going to do a project where you don't want a bunch of field wiring hardwired from terminals in your panel to additional terminal panels or marshalling panels out on the machine, then you're going to have to get in there and get used to these the nomenclature for these connectors. Now I show the length of zero because that proximity switch probably has flying leads on it which means that I'm going to have to go to a field wireable connector. So if you go across horizontally, connector, cable, length, connector, connector, that's the splitter. So I'm going to have to, um, and I'll drag this over. I'm going to have to have this connector and hardwire in two sets of flying leads um, I'm sorry, this is a splitter and that's a cable. So I'm going to have to come up with a connector here to hardwire those flying leads into two connectors that plug into these two connectors. And these two connectors are part of a device that has a third connector. So this connector splits into these two connectors and that's the part number. And what I can tell by the length, it's not a splitter, it's a Y cable. Same thing, electrically identical, but this one is uh, six tenths of a meter, which is roughly 18 inches in length. So it's a splitter cable or a Y cable that has two connectors that Y into one connector. Then I've got another cable that's one meter long and here's the connector nomenclature. And look at these two. They're both M12, 4-pin, 5-pin, female, male, coded A. And so this technically would be coded A as well, but it did not say that in the documentation. But I know they fit. And that's the 1732E remote I.O. module. So you see what's going on here. If you don't do something like this, uh, you're going to get confused. <laughs> I know I did because I started out and I was not this detailed. And finally I realized that I was not able to mentally keep track of all these different part numbers. Now red means that I needed to verify these details and I didn't go back and update my spreadsheet. That's another thing that you get used to after a while is that you have to go back and update some of these things. I'm going to pull back out here. Uh, see what else I have down here. Okay. This is a photo I from a conveyor and I don't have any details in there yet. That's because this was added at the last minute. That whole conveyor on this project, the VFD, the, all of the cylinders that move products around on it, sensors and everything that was all added. So, remember I told you this project is not done. 
I'm seeing that I have to go back and do a really close double check for the details. But you can see what's going on here. I'm in the process of designing this. You don't have to do it this way. Okay, you can come up with your own method to organize. So these are SensorGuard inputs and they are part of the safety switches that go to these actual IOs. So this cable information is probably irrelevant because there is one cable that goes from the whole guard door switch through ethernet back to the main panel and I it's just one cable and I purchased it with uh, the guard door switches okay notice here epoxy ready to dispense cycle complete now those may be the actual tag names and there's the epoxy level remember that one analog input and that analog input it does need cabling going from that sensor back to all the way back to the main panel let's drag over here and see if I completed it no I didn't now it may be that I don't need any more than this so okay five meters I've got a five meter cable four wires it's going to go to the 1769 IF4 now remember it's not really an IF4 it's an IF4 OF2 Remember, this is that seven, that L27 ERM uh, controller that has four analog in and two analog out built into it. So I do have sufficient information in here for that analog input. Down here, I don't have any information because this wasn't really available yet, but I did pre-assign it to nomenclature. So this is output four, five, six, seven, Output two, three, so see it's zero through eight, but I organized them by function, not by number. So this is another use for a spreadsheet. And then once you start creating these spreadsheets, you need to go back to them when you're designing to see what you specified. In other words, once you do something, you need to, you need to stick to it. Okay, so those are cables, Y connectors, etc. Okay, this is the panel layout. Now this is kind of crude. I'm not using the automation of this SkyCAD package because my library, you know, over here, my library, symbol library, I don't have symbols for a panel view plus 700. I don't have images and nomenclature for all this stuff none of it so I actually let's take this fuse block here I actually went to the manufacturer's site and brought up the three pole fuse holder on the screen use Snagit I use Snagit and Camtasia Studio they're from a company called TechSmith I use Snagit to grab this image crop it go to the manufacturer's manual, look at the size, and then I scale my captured image to that size. So this is actually the correct size. Okay, you, see, you can see here that for my line filter, my reactor, line reactor, uh, that's a line that I couldn't capture the image without, and I didn't want to waste the time to block it out in a graphics package so I just left it in there see and these are dimension lines that's what this is this is the dimension line so I just went in and did a screen capture and then brought it up in my panel view here my the view of my panel and then scaled it to the manufacturer's information so what I have here is that's the 24 volt DC power supply don't know why A is in there twice because there is only one mean well 24 volt DC power supply. This is a single board computer for some barcode work. This is my control transformer. This is the power distribution block down here. This is the surge protector right here. See, I should just look at my own notes, huh? So this is a surge protector. This is a line reactor. This is your fuse disconnect. And that square shaft I talk about comes out of this spot right here and it sticks out far enough that you can't can't close the door on it 
So you have to cut a hole in the door and then you mount the handle on the door. And that's what rotates this switch to disconnect the power from the upper terminals to the lower terminals through these fuses. This is a set of terminal blocks and they are 1492 Allen Bradley blocks, 1492P. And if I get some time, I'll discuss those. They are really cool. Of course, they're gonna be more expensive. If they're cool, they cost money, right? Just like cool shoes cost more than not cool shoes. Cool, not cool shoes protect your feet, might keep them warm, but they're not cool, but they're also not expensive. So here you can see 1492P. Uh, these are power distribution 1492 for low voltage for our 24 volts. This is the general bank of terminal blocks for everything else. And we, when we go to terminals, that's that strip right there with the nomenclature, okay? The gray is wire duct. Now, remember I told you that this panel is a little small for this amount of equipment. That's not 25% spare space, it's really not. There should be 20, 25% spare blank space then this terminal strip, or rather I should say DIN rail, should have 20% empty DIN rail, 20% empty DIN rail, 20% empty DIN rail, 20% empty DIN rail, and it doesn't. So this does not meet the requirement, the conventional requirement of 20% spare space. This space here on DIN rails is more valuable than this space. Yes, you can throw something big in here, Let's say we wanted to add another variable frequency drive. That's going to be a problem. You can squeeze one in here with the fuse blocks and the drive. You could squeeze one in here. You might even squeeze in two. I dare say you could squeeze in two. And when the panel builders actually build this, they may move this power distribution block more over here. As a matter of fact, uh, looking right now, because remember, the three phase comes in here, it comes in the upper corner, comes into this first, then into here, it comes out of here and goes down to here. And then it goes from here to here, here, up to here, here, down to here, and here, down to these. These are for the robot and for the epoxy dispense. These are fuse holders, okay? The 24 volts DC, goes down here to your L27 ERM. That's, uh, that looks like a PLC because it is an LC30, but it's in red plastic, and it just so happens it's the safety, programmable safety relay. I, right here, safety relay, AB, 440C, CR30, 22BBB. So this is the safety relay and the uh, force-guided ice cube relays that are going to distribute all the dual channel safety to robots and everything else. Down here, we have the single board computer. We have the 16 port unmanaged ethernet switch, and we have the L27 ERM. These are the breakout boards for the three robots. If you hadn't noticed, all of the higher voltage, higher current stuff is over here on this side. And then you have a little over towards here. All this is pretty much DC. So we try to keep the two separated. I would like a little more space than this between these conductors carrying current three phase from the distribution block down to these fuse blocks. I would really like some more space, but the panel and the enclosure was already purchased. I did make it well known that I wasn't happy about it, but I said I can fit everything on there. So I'm just hoping I don't end up with noise. Now, if I do, there's some cheap tricks you can do. I can go into this wire duct here and pop all the wire out of it, out of the way. And then I can take foil and uh, you can actually buy uh foil with adhesive on it. So it's like a shiny aluminum tape. And you can apply that on the sides, the bottom of this wire duct, and if you want, inside the lid. Any kind of radiated energy is 
under the limitation of the inverse square law. And the inverse square law says if you double the distance, you cut the strength to one fourth. So you take the inverse of two, which is one half, you square it and you got one fourth. One half times one half is one fourth. So if I double the distance between something that generates electromagnetic energy or electromagnetic interference, if I double the distance, I cut the interference to one fourth. If I provide shielding, it's even more effective. So I could put foil shielding inside of this wire duct and inside of the, at least the top of this. And you know, they might even make wire duct that comes that way. You know, I've never, I've never thought about it. I've never looked because normally you wouldn't do something like that because you would have enough space to spread this stuff out. So I would like at least four, five, six inches right here between all this stuff and this stuff. And you're going to find that most panel designs have all of the high voltage or the high current stuff on one side and all the DC stuff on the other side. In other words, stuff that might be sensitive to noise. Another thing that I always do is I put the electronics at the bottom of the panel because heat rises. So if you were to put sensors inside this panel, you might know, notice up to 15, 20 degrees difference from the top of the panel to the bottom. Cooler down here, hotter up here. And of course, that all that differential depends on uh, what the uh, calories or energy is being generated inside the panel, the temperature outside the panel. Now, these panels are steel, so they're pretty good conductors of thermal energy. You could also put an exhaust fan on this, and what you would do is on the side of the panel, the enclosure, you would put a vent down here, and then you would put a vent probably up here. And I'm saying that because I would want to pull the heat from the bottom up to the top, but not vent it past the power supply. I might rethink that whole thing. So that's about as much as I can squeeze out of the panel layout. Now, the software would have done most of this automatically if all of these uh, devices were in the library. All of the modern software packages, whether it be Logix 5000 or Factory Talk View ME or SkyCAD, AutoCAD, all of them use something called information object modeling. And what that means is you create an information object. So let's say you create one called Dog. In that information object, information, you're going to have height, width, length, weight, color, length of hair, color of eyes, and all the other details that a dog could have. But the class of objects, information object, is dog. There's no details. Only it's a class of objects, and there is a field for every individual piece of information that differ, would differentiate one dog from another. So you create this class of objects. Then when you actually have a dog, you create an instance of that class of objects that's called instantiation. You'll hear that term. And the more you stay in this business, the more you're going to hear it. So you create an instance called Chihuahua. And you're going to have a uh, small height, width, length, weight, color could be varied, um, you know, short hair, long hair. You see what I mean? So your library is made up of class of objects like motors. That's a class of objects. Drives, that's a class of objects. And inside of each library, I'll just click on one to see if I get anything because I'm new to this software. Okay, I've got some stuff in here. I might have even created some of it. No, I didn't. I don't even know what brand it is. ACS 355 03 E blah, blah, blah. Now, just because it's in here for the power, let's see if that's something else. Same thing, power. I don't know what all this stuff is. I didn't create any of it. But these are instances of some class of objects. The important thing here 
if these library objects are complete, then they have details, including an image. So if you add one into your design anywhere back here, let's go back here. Let's say I added in uh, the uh, CR30, the safety relay. If I add one into the design and it's in the library, then everything you need for panel layout, this picture right here, that would be already created, including all the dimensions, the DIN rail mounting, all the details. This isn't. I captured this image and then pasted it in here and scaled it. If I was taking advantage of the full automation, it would be in the library. And when I put it in back here under the control sheet, it would automatically want to be, all those physical details would want to be on the panel layout. And so you could tell it to do a panel layout and it would do its best job to organize everything. Then you can go in and move it around to your taste. We didn't have none of that on this project. This is all by guessing by golly, but it'll work. So is that the library is limited. However, I do know that they are creating a user accessible database so people can go in and add completed library objects that have everything you need to completely integrate it into the panel layout, the power consumption. You can automate this so I can go to uh, the software and I can enter a sheet. I can enter onto a sheet all the power consumption because every single device has a power consumption, voltage, current, three phase, single phase, etc. And the software automatically tabulates that. So there's a lot of cool stuff in all of these CAD packages. AutoCAD is going to come with a full ample library because it's been around a million years. Remember, I used it 15 or more years ago back when it first appeared on the scene. Back then, there were no blocks. There were no library objects. Okay, folks, uh, this has gone way long. And uh, I wasn't paying attention to the clock. I was just flapping my pie hole, as they used to say back in the day. So I do appreciate your watching this. If you got anything out of it uh, and you like it, click on the like. Uh, God bless your efforts, and I hope you're successful at doing controls engineering. Thank you.